who wants to learn about how this disease actually manifests and like causes the disease state and symptomatic states in you it's gonna be easy to get real lost in this we're gonna be going heavy into immune systems how they work uh different cells in the body how they work different parts of the lungs and how they work so it's gonna get pretty heavy in anatomy and immunology and molecular biology all right so here you have the trachea coming down the trachea is your windpipe we're going to be going through this very slowly and uh, get deeper and deeper as we go. So the trachea hits a little separation here. This is called the carina of the trachea. Uh, so this would be your left lung. This would be your right lung. These then branch more. Left lung has two lobes. I know this doesn't matter too much now, but these branches get smaller and smaller as we go down through. Um, so more and more branches, more and more branches, yada, 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 so forth. Uh, and then they get much, much smaller at the bottom. Uh, same over here on the right side. The right side has three lobes, though. And then here is the other two. Uh, so three lobes on the right lung. So this is how air, this is how the virus, let's, what, let's, let's make the virus that lime green color. Um, so if you breathe in the virus, this is our, the spike proteins I draw on the virus. Virus comes in and into your trachea. You breathe it in. Um, someone coughed on you. So someone coughed and you got the virus here. Um, this was you breathing it in up here. Okay, now down at the end of these little uh, lungs. So Here's the trachea. This is the carina of the trachea. This is a primary bronchi, second de uh, second degree uh, bronchi. Then there's a third degree. Then you get to the bronchioles, and then you get to the terminal bronchioles. Uh, when you get to the terminal bronchioles, you start adding these little ball-like structures at the bottom. Now, this is where respiration occurs. These structures here, uh, so these structures are called your alveoli. Um, your alveoli is where gas exchange occurs. Uh, so you have, you know, you're constantly breathing in and out. Uh, as you know, you bring in oxygen in, so O2 comes in and CO2 comes out. Uh, so it's just as what, you know, normal respiration and that interchange is at these alveoli. Now, what happens, how, what happens when you breathe? You breathe in, air comes in, and then you have to get it to your blood. So there's an interchange here so let's do veins in blue. So you have veins that are coming in. They're called your, not well, pulmonary arteries is what they're called. So pulmonary arteries are coming in. So you have an artery coming in. Well, I keep saying artery, but I mean to say vein. And it forms a capillary bed over your little alveolar, alveoli. And then that blood gets oxygenated, which then we draw in red, and then goes out the pulmonary uh, veins and back to the heart so that's how you get oxygen in so here um, the air not the air but the gas coming back will be low in o2 and it'd be high in co2 uh, then it exchange in those capillaries uh, with the alveoli then you breathe out the co2 you reload the oxygen that the air going back to your tissues is now high in o2 and it's now low in co2 so now we want to zoom in to this region. Uh, so here is a single alveoli. So this arrow is going to come up here now. So at the base of this, let's just draw that uh, capillary going by. Uh, so this is just a blood vessel going through here. And, and in here we have the alveoli. Now the virus gets down here. Uh, so now we have the virus in here as well, our little green guy. Inside it has the RNA in it. Uh, now. In your alveoli, you have a couple different cells. You have ones that are called type 1 uh, pneumocytes or type 1 alveolar cells. You also have type 2 alveolar cells. Type 2 alveolar cells or type 2 pneumocytes. So here, uh, type 2. These ones release something called surfactant. Uh, surfactant is what makes it so your little alveolar walls down here don't collapse on themselves because of the presence of water. Now you have, you know, you have your red blood cells going through your your blood here, and you have this exchange of gas and O2. 
Um, lots of stuff is happening right here. Now, how does this virus actually infect you and be pathogenic? Let's expand. This is a uh, type 2 alveolar cell. So this is what releases surfactant. Um, so surfactant is this lipid protein molecule that reduces the surface tension of the water in your lungs. Um, so these type 2 alveolar cells express something on their surface. So now we're going to add this receptor. This is way bigger than it should be. This one is called the ACE2 receptor. We have the coronavirus. It has the RNA in it. And it has these spike proteins on it. These spike proteins bind specifically to this receptor. Uh, so ACE2, so this is part of the RAS pathway in the body, the renin-angiotensin uh, synthesis pathway. So this is an important regulator of um, hypertension and inflammation. Um, so activating angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and renin, at the kidney so what this pathway does is that it activates the system uh, and causes blood pressure to increase blood flow to increase um, so it causes vasodilation which opens up the blood flow um, now when I first heard this I'm like wait what I, did, I never heard of angiotensin uh, converting enzyme 2 that receptor being in the lungs um, that surprised me. I know about it in the cardiovascular system, in the kidneys, etc. I never heard of this existing in the lungs. So this is when I did my little deep dive into it to understand how this actually got into the cell. So what happens is this type 2 alveolar cell, this binds. So this protein binds. This protein then, this receptor binds here. It comes in and then we, it puts the RNA in here. And then it uses this cell's machinery to replicate that virus and then actually presents these spike proteins on its surface uh, within these alveolar cells. So then when this happens, this is when your body finally sees it. Your body then one could attack these type two alveolar cells to destroy them because these cells are like, hey, something's infecting me, help. Uh, so now we have a dendritic cell. A dendritic cell is a blobular macrophage looking thing. Um, what this thing does is that it engulfs the virus. So it would engulf the virus. So this is part of the immune response. And this is what happens when the virus first gets into this region right here. So this dendritic cell would actually be up in here. Um, it would engulf the virus there. Now this stuff isn't drawn to scale. <laughs> This dendritic cell is massive compared to this virus. Um, but what happens then is something really cool. This becomes what's called an APC, which stands for antigen presenting cell. So what that means is that it uptakes the, the sequences, the proteins from this. This is like ancient tribal warfare. This is how I like to describe this when talking about immunology to my students. This dendritic cell eats the virus. They eat bacteria and other fragments as well. It's their job, they're immune system patrollers. So they eat these fragments. They chop them up. Imagine the tribal people chopping up the bodies of their enemies. And then they wear the bones on their, you know, as necklaces or um, they wear their ears on their necklace. You know what I mean. You've seen those tribal things where they wear the pieces of their enemies. Um, and that's kind of what these dendritic cells do. So they eat this virus. And then they actually present different fragments of this virus on the surface. So this virus is made up of different proteins. And so this dendritic cell then goes around and says, hey, look, immune system, look what I found. The dendritic cell then leaves and goes to the um, lymph nodes to activate the response. These dendritic cells also, when they eat something like this, they start releasing signals. Um, these signals are called uh, interleukins and cytokines. Think of these things as like the Red Bull. Uh, I know interleukins is hard to see there. Uh, think of these as the Red Bull or the caffeine of your immune system. These little chemicals start being secreted out by these dendritic cells. And these mount a massive immune response to that region. All these other cells then come there, brings in macrophages, neutrophils. But 
neutrophils are an interesting thing reason i said that Neut neutrophils don't can't do anything in a situation because neutrophils can only fight bacteria um neutrophils are one of your white blood cells and they know if you have a bacterial or viral infection when you go and get checked based on your neutrophil counts but these cytokines and interleukins can bring them in this brings in more immune responders to this region now another thing these interleukins and cytokines do is that they can cause inflammation um other cells can come in called basophils which release histamine can cause an inflammatory response in this region not only that this ace2 receptor because it's linked to hypertension can also cause inflammation in this region so in the end what this causes is an inflammatory problem between this capillary and alveolar interface which makes it really difficult to exchange oxygen and co2 um, specifically oxygen uh, so a lot of these studies have analyzed the oxygen loading capacity on the hemoglobin of the patients because they're inefficiently able to load oxygen onto the hemoglobin because it can't pass through this inflammation layer so key steps of treatment is anti-inflammatories to get this inflammation down um, and also to ventilate and provide oxygen for those patients but ventilation can sometimes cause more issues if you overload with oxygen. So it has to be very careful when that's done. Um, but yeah, so this is like a little first step in this immune response here. But it's really cool how it works. And then, so it can go into these um, type 2 alveolar cells. But these type 2 alveolar cells are important for producing surfactant. And that surfactant helps maintain the structure of your alveoli. With every breath, your alveoli are expanding and coming back water could actually cause your alveoli to collapse. So uh, Pixel Breath asked, uh, would someone immunocompromised fare better? Uh, not necessarily, because that's what I was just about to get into. So if someone is immunocompromised with SARS-CoV-2, then what would happen would be their type two alveolar cells would be still affected, and then they'd be producing less surfactant. And so what happens is these cells get overrun, they could lyse, they could go through apoptosis, and you'd actually lose these type 2 alveolar cells then, which are very important in your alveoli. And not only that, the virus binding to these ACE2 receptors would cause inflammation on its own in that region. So your immune response can cause additional pain and problems, but the virus itself will still be causing problems and replicating without that immune response. So Polly Wannabe asked, is there such a thing as a more efficient evolution so fast that your immune system can't keep up? And that's one thing about viruses like influenza virus can easily mix strains and mutate to something different that we can't be fight against um and that's it's that it's that's an, this is another rna based virus so it's tricky um could it that second infection could it be a different strain um and you know you hope it's not you hope it didn't already evolve but the more people this virus is in, the more replication it has, the more chances that another random mutation could arise. Um, but, you know, it's 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 random. That's, that's evolution. It's not point directed. The virus doesn't evolve to be like, I need to bind to the ACE2 receptor better. No, it just, a, a random, you know, sequence became undone, came back together, added a base, completely random.